So welcome to the first um, Center for Acoustics Research and Education seminar of the semester. We're using this seminar as an opportunity to let Gabe Benegas um, speak to us today. Um, we are considering um, hiring him into the Center for Acoustics Research and Education, and this is um, part of the process. Uh, Gabe is currently a, a postdoc here at UNH, and he's my postdoc. Uh, the topic that he's working on, or the project he's working on with me, is on looking at the, the temporal response of the seafloor using acoustics, or the, uh, the temporal changes in the acoustic response. I, I poached, and so Gabe's been here, I guess, about eight months. I poached Gabe from a friend of mine where he was previously at the University of Texas. He was at the Applied Research Lab at the University of Texas, where he was looking at um, the biological effects on the acoustic properties of the sediment. Um, that's important for some of the work I do, um, which is, is trying to understand those effects, but Gabe is also interested in trying to invert those acoustics to say something about the biology, something about the carbon capture, something about the seafloor itself. So he's, he's really interested in the inverse problem. I'm working backwards. Um, before Gabe was at the Applied Research Lab at the University of Texas, um, he did his PhD at, at uh, UT in mechan mechanical engineering, where he was also working at the, um, the the effects of biology on the acoustic properties of the seafloor. So I'm going to, well, let me just, one more, one more thing. So Gabe has been extremely active as my postdoc. He has brought in, he has a current, he's a PI on a current project that just came in and he's a co-PI of another project that I'm on. So we're really excited to have Gabe um, with us and we hope he stays. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Gabe. All right, thanks, Tony. Um, I'm excited to be here. I think this is the third seminar I've given in my bedroom. So I'm hoping that to change soon, but I'm excited to be here nonetheless. So like my title suggests, talking about active sediments. Um, in the Navy, they don't really think sediments are active. So if you'd ask a benthic ecologist, they'd probably roll their eyes, but they think it's stationary. And so that's where a lot of this funding comes from to, to study how the seabed changes as a, as a function of time. And I'll go into that a little bit here. So jumping in, um, the continental shelf and coastlines are home to, some of the most, home to most oceanic life. Some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet can be found there wetlands, uh, seagrasses, mangrove forests, etc. The humans, um, many of the cities are located on estuaries. 22 out of the 32 largest cities are on estuaries. 90% of the fishery production can be found within the continental shelf. Um, strategic interests are evident. Um, that's where a lot of the funding, um, what I'll be talking about today, comes from the Office of Naval Research. And about a third of the planet's oil and gas can be found within the continental shelf margins. All of these things use acoustics one way or another. And so what are some of the challenges in operating in these environments? Um, in terms of what I'll talk to you about today is um, when, the shell, when the water gets shallow, Yes, the, most of the propagation of acoustics travels through the water column itself, and there's, there are many challenges to do with um, scattering off of um, waves and fish in the water column. But when your when you're shallow water waveguide, um, here is a toy problem, a Navy problem here, where you have 60 meter depth and you're trying to propagate 30 kilometers uh, to, for, uh, to, to detect a target here, which could be a submarine. This is a scale view, this blue line here is actually to scale uh, the water column. So it's kind of like you're, you're trying to yell down a sheet of glass and there are all of these instances where the sound interacts with both the, su the sur surface on top, uh, air, air water interface, and also the water sediment interface. So every time that interaction happens, the sound is altered in some way. And so you need to have a good understanding of the ocean bottom uh, to adequately detect a target in this case, but any, any situation where you have a lot of interactions, the ocean bottom, you need to have it be well characterized. And so, like I said, in, in the Navy, they, they go out and they do these um, 
surveys and they characterize the sediment and it doesn't change. It's like that um, until they go out and survey it again, which could happen, you know, can happen for decades. So active sediments can complicate acoustics. Um, the first, they'll be talking about three um, research projects that I've worked on in the past. Um, and I'm just sort of going to give you the meat and potatoes. I'm not really going to go very in depth into this. It's going to still be high level. Um, but I just want to throw a lot of the things at you and see um, if there's anything that interests you at all or um, all interests me, of course. But so for the first situation, we'll be talking about um, temperature and salinity variability of the bottom water. Bottom water, you can also think of it as um, the water very close to the bottom of the ocean, very close to the sediment. Um, so how does that reflect re affect reflectivity? And we're only going to be looking at uh, diffusion and conduction to the sediment. So there's can be a lot more things that happen when, when a, a wedge or a, um, um, some kind of warm eddy impinges upon the, the sediment. But I'm only going to be looking at what's happening in, in the sediment. And so if you look at, if you, if you can understand how um, sound reflects off of the ocean bottom, it's dependent not only on the acoustics of the ocean bottom, but also the acoustics on the water, of the, of the acoustics of the water. So sediment um, impedance is Z here. So the impedance of the sediment, and you have the impedance of the water above. So if the water is changing, you can also have variability in that, in that return uh, from, the, from the ocean bottom. Next, uh, I'll be talking about some preliminary uh, measurements I made in um, biologically active sediments, sediments containing a lot of wind fauna. Um, you can have worms that burrow, clam shells that go in. And so I won't go into that too much, but I really want to get into uh, the acoustics of flora and particularly organic carbon. And I'll go into this later in the talk, but here we have a, a CT rendering of a seagrass blade coiled up. And um, within the sediment, you also have a lot of organic carbon storage. I'm going to show you how uh, that affects acoustics and how we potentially could use acoustics to uh, monitor these things. So let's start with the first topic. So motivation, um, I was part of a uh, seabed characterization experiment that maybe funded a, a bunch of scientists to go out and characterize this patch of mud that's off the coast of New England, called the New England Mud Patch. Um, basically, they wanted to know, well, what are the acoustic properties of this mud? Uh, because it's, it's so far, a lot of work has been done on sands, but not so much has been on, on fine grains. So, the problem here, though, was when this experiment has been going on, it goes on for, still going on, actually, but um, every time they come back, it's at a different season, or there could be a different um, hydrodynamic condition above it. And so what effect does that have on the ability to, to adequately characterize this sediment? So if we're looking at across the shelf here, this is a bird's eye view of the mud patch. Now we're looking at cross shelf where the mud patch is here. Um, you have temperature variability and salinity variability. Within a matter of two weeks, you get these warm rings, eddies that impinge upon the shelf um, from the Gulf Stream. And so typically when you're characterizing a bunch of different sediments from all around the world that have different um, types of water that are inside the, the pores of the sediment. There's a generally a normalization that you can perform to compare um, ap on apples to apples, essentially, by normalizing the sediment sound speed by the sound speed of the pore water. And it's often assumed that the pore water is the same as the bottom water. That means everything's quasi-static uh, in the sense that if anything happens drastically, um, it has, has been long enough so that all the water can pull a bit. So I'm going to challenge that assumption and just look a little more inland at an estuary in Buzzards Bay. And this might not always be true um, 
particularly with salinity here. You can see the salinity profile. This is salinity, time and hours. This is the tidal cycle of the bottom water. Um, the salinity of the mud stays relatively constant. Some work is talking about time scales now. Some work has been done on seasonal um, time scales where seasonal temperature changes can cause significant changes in seismic reflectivity. Here we have the reflection coefficient as a function of frequency um, with two sediments of, of differing porosities. And different months of the year here shows drastic changes in low frequency reflectivity but nothing much in the active sonar range, anything above about a kilohertz. So to add to this bit of knowledge, salinity fluctuations haven't been investigated. Um, and also variabilities in different timescales hasn't been investigated. So is there a, a generalized way that we can look at variability of the bottom water and say whether we should care about it or not, depending on our frequency range, depending on magnitude of the fluctuation, et cetera. So we conducted a, um, in this publication down here, we conducted a um, high frequency experiment. I'll zoom, into, zoom into this, um, where we have an idealized clay, idealized sediment, a kaolinite clay, we used two different types of clay in this experiment. And we measured the <clears throat> reflectivity of that clay, bottom loss, um, as a function of we did this in salt water, and you can't really see it very well here, but there is a trap door that slot can be slid in and out. Um, and we did that because we first characterized it in fresh water, put this, the trap door back on it, and then put it in salt in a salt water bath, a very salty bath, just to be able to capture the physics. Um, open the, the 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 trap door and let diffusion uh, occur. And while that was happening, we were taking reflection measurements as a function of window. <clears throat> this is a high frequency experiment taken out of megahertz. So I was able to uh, derive an analytical, analytical expression for the diffusion of salt into a substrate um, that mirrors this kind of initial condition. And I coupled that model with an acoustics model. I'm not going to talk about the model. I'm just going to say that I fit the model to the data and was able to infer a diffusion coefficient of salt in these two different types of clays. So we have bottom loss of these two clays as a function of angular incidence. You can see that the model tracks pretty well with the, with the data. So it seems like that's the physics that's occurring, some kind of diffusion. Um, we're able to take that diffusion coefficient and model it at lower frequencies. So here's the diffusion coefficient of uh, RSA, this top plot here. And I'll orient you on this plot because I'm it's a it's an animation, so it's things are going to start moving around. I want to zoom in um, to here. We have bottom loss in the top plot in color in decibels, and we're plotting it as a function of frequency and the angle of incidence, so the angle at which the sound penetrates the sediment. Here we have phase of that reflected signal in degrees. And down here is the salinity profile. So something I didn't mention about the model is that the model essentially assumes that the structure of the sediments remains constant. And the only thing that's allowed to change in the model is the salinity of the pore water. And so here you see uh, the, the salinity um, depth profile and in, into the mud for a sinusoidally varying um, boundary condition. So to start looking at this animation, um, you can see that as the bottom water is varying down, uh, as the bottom water is varying down here, um, we get a lag um, and we have different salinity profiles as a function of time. And you can tell that there's a, a this characteristic depth here that I think a lot, of, a lot of things are changing, but below which nothing much is changing. So if you take that characteristic length straight from the math, it's equal, it's dependent on the square root of the diffusion coefficient and this period of oscillation. So if you compare that 
to a wavelength, for instance, that characteristic length to a wavelength, you can make some generalizations. You can say, okay, look, uh, at high frequencies, low, small wavelengths, um, I don't see much change in reflectivity, but when I go in lower frequencies, I do. And this is similar to what uh, the paper by Warren Wood saw, seasonal variations. The difference is uh, this characteristic depth changes. So his was very long um, because of the fact he was he had a very large period of oscillation while I'm, um, and, and he also had temperature variability. So the diffusion coefficient in terms of temperature is a lot faster than the fusion in terms of salt. So this can change and we can make some neat realizations. So here I have this plot that shows kind of a roadmap to whether or not I should care about a variability given my frequency of the signal and the period of variability in days. And so I create these lines here that separate these different regions where in green you are insensitive to temperature and insulin fluctuations, no matter how large. Uh, since in yellow, you're sensitive to only salinity fluctuations, and in red, you're sensitive to both temperature and salinity fluctuations. And I have these three uh, time scales of interest here. This is the New England mud patch interest about a couple of weeks, the tidal cycle, and the seasonal um, variability. So back to that sound speed ratio approximation uh, is whether or not it's appropriate or not to characterize it. Um, it's appropriate whether when you're in this region, but not appropriate when you're in these two regions. The one caveat, of course, is even if you're in the red region and there's not a lot of variability in terms of the magnitude of the variability, you still might not care about that variability. So just keep that in mind. All right, moving on to some preliminary work with um, acoustics of biologically active sediments. Uh, this is in, oh, not yet. Um, so just some background on this. Um, in fauna are well-known ecosystem engineers. Um, they can do many things that could very well affect the acoustic backscatter or propagation through the sediments. They burrow, they construct tubes, uh, they feed on and uh, defecate sediments. Um, they produce high viscosity mucus that can affect the the sound propagation, and it alters things like sediment roughness and sediment permeability. All these things are important in sediment acoustics. So in collaboration with Dauphin Island Sea Lab, um, our collaborator Kelly Dorgan is a benthic ecologist um, that studies worms. And we took some cores off in, the, in this uh, in, in the, called Petty Boy Pass, they pronounce it down there. It's, it's French for small, uh, small forest. And we took 15 cores from these, these sites and found a lot of uh, creepy crawlers. So here's, a, here's Diopatra, is a tube building worm, it uses mostly sediments and mucus to make the, the, the worm tubes. Um, here is Oenia. Uh, it uses uh, shell hash to make its tubes so that can potentially affect high frequency scattering. And you have the well known brittle star, which is a, a well known biotrophy. So, it's a proceedings paper on it. So, if you're interested in this, you can look, look in this pub. But um, I built a core and resonance logger during my PhD. And it's a broadband core logger. So, um, if anyone necessarily cares, it it can go through a large range of frequencies and it can also have a functionality where it can resonate the entire sediment column. And by doing that, you can invert or the uh, acoustic, acoustic properties of the whole column at lower frequencies. The nice part about it is it's um, automated. Oh, it's completely automated. Um, so here's just a little time lapse of it going. It's just set it up and then do other things or prepare the, the next sample. And it basically sends a pulse through the sediment and is received on, on the other side of the core and you can measure things like sound speed and attenuation of the sediment. So uh, I don't have this with me at the moment, but if anybody is interested in having this kind of functionality, you can talk to me. It's, it's relatively cheap to make. Um, we just need sort of off-the-shelf lab equipment, and then 
and then I can build it. So I'd like to have this at UNH. So if anyone's interested, please, please let me know. So some highlights of the results. Um, I'll zoom in here. So there's been a lot of work in studying the acoustic properties of sediments, you can imagine different types of sediments. And so Richardson and Briggs, this line here um, is a average of hundreds of measurements, maybe thousands of measurements that were performed over the, this last uh, half century. Um, so the attenuation that struck me was that it is all higher than these uh, trends that were um, found by, by Richardson and Briggs. And I, I think that has to do with the amount of mucus involved in, in these um, cohesive sediments, as opposed to something that's found further off the shelf without as much biological activity. Um, another thing we looked at is the sound speed difference due to structuring biodensity. So uh, structuring biodensity is just the amount of critters per square volume, uh, per, per volume uh, in, in, in the core as a function of depth. And structuring just refers to their, the way in which they alter the sediment. They build tubes and they, build, they have burrow, burrowing effects in the sediment. And so when you, when you took a, a core without any in fauna as control and we compared that with in fauna cores, um, we found that there was a weak but negative trend in this where you, you get a reduction in sound speed uh, with more structuring uh, worms. And perhaps the most interesting, in my opinion, um, result is this notion of sound speed variability, which is a, kind of a, a proxy for anisotropy of the sediment. Um, and this, I think, has a lot to do with the burrowing and the tubes themselves, not so much the, 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 the critters, but the, 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 how they change the sediments. And it turns out if we measured the acoustic propagation, the sound speed and attenuation across either, across different directions uh, on the core, then we found that there was more variability as the total biodensity increased. So again, these are preliminary results, but uh, interesting to just to, to talk about and, and something that I'll build upon um, here at UNH. So finally, uh, flora and organic carbon. This is something I'm really interested in. Um, they call it blue carbon when organic carbon is stored in certain ecosystems like marshes, mangroves, and uh, seagrasses. Um, and so let's get into that. So what, why do people care about organic carbon? Well, um, bird's eye view is, well, CO2 concentrations are really high in the atmosphere. A lot of it gets absorbed into the ocean and seagrasses are really efficient carbon um, photosynthesizers. So Posidonia oceanica here is called the lung of the sea. Uh, it's really good at sucking CO2 from the water and making it into plants and, um, eventually burying that into the sediment. So it accounts for not, seagrasses globally account for up to 10% of the annual burial of organic carbon. And 90% of that is actually stored in the sediment. Um, who knew? Here's a transmission electron microscopy image taken um, from a, a mud bank on the Mississippi River actually. So this is a, isn't a, a sediment in a seagrass meadow, but it's a sediment non-seagrass bearing site. And you can see that it's the organic matter that creates, um, that's able to suspend these organic particles. So just, just to let you know, in, the, in, in sediment acoustics, all we think of, in our, our set of what, what sediments are, is just sand, silt, clay, and water. There are, we, we very rarely get into, oh, what does the organics do uh, to this sediment versus this other sediment? That is. As a, as a community, we believe that's not important. I'm, I'm also going to challenge that assumption. Just to give you an idea of how much organic carbon this actually stores, it's about 25 million liters equivalent of CO2, gaseous CO2 uh, per acre. And that's twice as effective as a terrestrial forest, so very efficient. And so with these 
really important um, carbon sinks, they need to be protected, right? And so in order for them to be protected, uh, they need to, there's a carbon budgeting scheme that is, is, is being implemented um, to protect them. But in order for that to work, you need to have a good understanding of exactly how much carbon does this ecosystem store? Are they all the same? Are they all just like Posidonia oceanica? Or do some of them not store as much carbon as others? And, and what factors affect their ability to store carbon? So these are important. There's a factor of five uncertainties. So Ecologists are, are, are calling for new methods um, for measuring sediment carbon stocks and that it's essential for improving the estimates and, and, and therefore protecting these ecosystems. So this is the potential for acoustics. Acoustics is a tool that can be implemented in situ and you can potentially have an instantaneous measurement of this if, if, if there isn't even sensitive to it. So the first thing we have to determine is, well, how sensitive is acoustics to this organic carbon. Um, and that, that is um, partially answered in, in, our, in our publication down here. But I'm, I'm going to go a step further and, and explore whether or not it can be sensed acoustically. And that's some preliminary work that I did as a postdoc back at UT Austin, but I'm, I'm trying to continue uh, that as well in future work. So here's just a quick outline of blue carbon talk, this part of the talk. Um, we have a seagrass bearing sediment experiment that we're going to talk about. We'll be talking about the constituents of this unique type of sediment in seagrass meadows, um, some correlations among the acoustic properties, the geotechnical properties, the organic properties of these sediments. And I'll be talking about a qualitative uh, organic sediment theory that we came up with to describe our findings and that are in line with the sedimentology literature in general. We'll talk about some in situ sensor developments um, that happened at, back in Austin and I'm trying to continue doing and we'll wrap up while we talk with conclusions. So let's talk with the set, let's start with the experiment. The very southern tip of Texas here, right next to South Padre Island, um, there is a hypersaline lagoon called the Lower Laguna Madre. It's home to some of the mo most of Texas's seagrass. Um, and here is our experimental site in um, STAR here. So we have taken four um, half meter long cores in seagrass and one in a bare patch, a patch without any seagrass on it as a, as a control. We took them back to the lab. We ran them through the core and resonance logger. Uh, when we took those cores oops, and analyze them for wet dry density, porosity, mud content using a laser particle analyzer. And I'm just referring to mud content as both the amount of part yeah, the volume of particles that are below uh, 63 microns in size. And then we also took organic total organic carbon measurements using a furnace and an elemental analyzer. So let's talk about the constituents, um, looking at depth profiles of, the, um, of these cores. So the shaded regions are all the seagrass cores um, and the solid lines is the bare patch core. And only one bare patch core is taken, that's why there's no spread. This is a spread of plus or minus one standard deviation. So in the leftmost plot here, we have the inorganic components or the, the um, at least size distributed particles of the sediment. Um, blue is mud, black is sand, uh, coarse is generally just shell hash. Um, here are the, what they mean in terms of their size, but we can characterize and on the right side, sorry, the right side, we have the organics. And so you can characterize the top layer as this organic rich layer that has a lot of mud, a lot of shells, um, and it contain, contains plant tissue and other decomposing organics. So uh, this is all great, but a lot of times I feel like I need to, to see what's inside the sediment. Oftentimes I just look at a sediment, it just, it all looks, it's either stinky or, you know, you can't see inside it. So you don't want to look at it very often. <laughs> you just want to measure it and get it over with. But if I were to take a small core 
and we did this and took it back to Austin, we were able to put it into a CT scanner and make some really beautiful renderings of what's inside. And it was eye-opening to me, especially because I said all I see is the sediment. So if we're able to remove the sediment, um, we can see a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot of shell hash, a lot of um, crab claws here, um, but this green stuff is the seagrass tissue. and and seagrass tissue and kind of organic-y like sludge uh, decomposing organics. So the elephant in the room is this blue stuff, which is actually the orenchoma inside the seagrass tissue. Um, and there are air channels. So if you know in underwater acoustics, it's, acoustics is very sensitive to the presence of these air channels. So at first I thought, well, we can't, we, we can no longer measure uh, organic carbon here because these, these things are gonna, it, it's gonna be way more sensitive to these, these air channels than it is the, the background sediment, which is the part that stores all the carbon. So here we have a rhizome and here we have a, a root that, that have their own air channels. So going back to the literature, I found this paper uh, by Dogen et al. that derived some um, effective medium properties of gas bearing sediments. And they were able to uh, find the sound speed and attenuation as a function of frequency of sediment without bubbles and sediment with bubbles. Now, keep in mind that these bubbles are spherical bubbles in the sediment. They are not encapsulated by any seagrass tissue. Um, you know, this is a spherical cow approach. Um, but nonetheless, um, I'll describe it. We'll have, uh, we have three different regions. Sorry, those are my dogs. Um, we have the low frequency woods limit where the compliance of the bubble uh, dominates the, um, these acoustic properties and you get a reduction in sound speed. You have a resonance where um, the frequency is on the order of the resonance of these bubbles and you have large amounts of attenuation. This is on a DB scale. So this is a massive jump and some interesting dispersion here in sound speed. Then you have an area above all that, you have high enough, if you're high enough above this resonance, you get, you're, you're basically free of bubble effects. Um, Carl ends up measuring right around here in this region. Um, now, of course, we performed many fits, many data fits from the model to the data to, to see if this was actually, this model well described, the, the sound propagation in these sediments, and it, it does, and I won't show them here uh, just for the sake of time, but just that is my assumption is that at the highest frequency that, that Carl measures, 300 kilohertz, you know, we're free of, of any bubble, effect, negligibly affected by bubbles. So that's, that's the assumption here going forward. Um, before we get to the correlations, um, just wanted to point out that sound speed is a balance between the, the stiffness of an elastic medium and the mass of that medium. So it's a stiffness mass balance. Um, and if we're trying to compare sound speed and bulk density, well, there have some interdependence, right? They're coupled due to this equation. So in order to decouple them to more adequately compare between these properties, um, I'm going to combine the bulk and shear stiffnesses into a acoustic parameter known as P wave modulus or acoustic stiffness. I also will say ultrasonic stiffness if it's above 20 kilohertz. I'll be throwing that around so just know what that means. Just that it's the stiffness that an acoustic wave sees or feels as it's propagating through an elastic medium. All right, let's get to some correlations. Back to that stiffness and mass relationship um, balance. And so that's the first thing I looked at. And I saw that there are these two regions, that, regimes that I thought were could be separated and something interesting was happening um, in either of them. So there's one region where here's P wave modulus, here's wet bulk density. If I plot a line of constant sound speed, this isovelocity region, I'm calling it in blue, which is really around the top 20 centimeters of the sediment, give or take, um, doesn't really, it has the same sound speed as that of seawater, but then you get to a stiffness dominated region where the stiffness dominates, that's why I made it that, um, and something else is happening here. So now we'll be looking at these properties um, in terms of these two, um, these two regimes here. 
So being uh, from the sediment acoustics community, I've, you know, it, it has to be the mud content. It can't be anything to do with the organics. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, there's, there's more mud on the top here. That must mean that there's, that's drop in stiffness is due to this mud content up here. It correlates, um, you know, if, if you look at it between regions, it kind of correlates, but if you look at it as a whole, it's just a big dot cloud. Um, it seems like mineral content is weakly correlated uh, to sediment stiffness, and maybe not, not what we think is happening here. Uh, prelude to what about the organics? Um, you might know how, where this is going. Everything collapses really nicely into these two seemingly linear regions um, with great Pearson correlation coefficients. Um, and in fact, better than any other comparison among uh, wet bulk density, porosity, wood content. If you compare all of those together, this was the most significant. Uh, correlation was with stiffness and organic carbon, which is really exciting. So, but, but why is the question? So we came up with this qualitative theory and that's in line with, with uh, sedimentology literature. And he, I'll, I'll explain it now. So generally the way that organics are uh, sequestered in sediments is that they're protected from aerobic or anaerobic decomposition because of the fact that they absorb onto mineral surfaces and in pore spaces. So you can see with low uh, amounts of organic carbon, um, this, little, this little white stuff that's coating all the grains and the particles, that's the organic carbon. This is just the diagram, of course, it's not necessarily accurate, but just to just demonstrate my point. Um, as you get more organic carbon absorbing onto the mineral spaces, these pore spaces. You, you get these compliant organic layers in the contact regions. There's a well-known sediment acoustics theory called viscous grain shearing. And as the name implies, the, the theory attributes the bulk propagation in um, uh, sediments due to these micro asperities rubbing together at these points here. And that is exactly where organics are most protected in those regions. So this could be very much a reason for this drop in stiffness, um, these compliant organic layers. And it's a drastic drop in comparison to this other region. You get to a point, again, in the sedimentology literature, they refer to this as the background or uh, refractory background level. It's also, I'm thinking of it as just kind of a saturation point where all the surfaces are saturated, um, the pore spaces are filled with organics, um, and you get a sudden drop in stiffness here, right when it starts to separate the frame. So there is um, the bulk wave propagation in sediments is to do with the stiffness of both their frame itself um, and also the, the stiffnesses of their constituents. So once you get past the saturation point and you see that all of these particles are now getting pushed apart, that st frame stiffness no longer exists. And that's what kind of describes this big chunk. And then from there on, it's mostly porosity that, that um, governs this relationship. So the more organics there are, um, just like this transmission electron microscopy image, you start getting suspension of, of these mineral components and further reduction in stiffness. Great. So this is another plot from the paper. Um, just looks at porosity as a function of uh, organic carbon and then mud content as a function of organic carbon. And if you're at all familiar with um, a lot of Lawrence Mayer's work up at the University of Maine, he plots these kind of uh, plots. I've seen him in, in a lot of his papers show this kind of relationship. Instead of mud content though, he, he actually uh, measures the, the surface area of the, of the, the grains. Um, and this mud content is sort of a proxy for that. And the more fine grains you have, the more surface area that sediment contains. And it looks just like this. And something that is interesting here is that in this region where um, all the organics are protected from, from decomposition in pore spaces or in absorbing onto mineral surfaces, 
you get a really good correlation between the amount of mud, the amount of surface area available to store that carbon and carbon. Very, very good. But then once the saturation point hits around this S set, it's called for saturation, U is undersaturated and O is oversaturated. Uh, once you pass this line, um, then it just, it's a dot cloud, it's uncorrelated because now uh, microbes can come in and start eating this, this organic carbon. And, and so there's not really as tight of a relationship anymore. And that's just like what he published in his work. So I think uh, there needs to be more investigation here in terms of more controlled laboratory experiments to compare to theory and even create some kind of organic sediment theory. Um, but this is a step forward. Really quickly, I just want to point out that not only P wave modulus um, correlates with organic carbon, but se sediment acoustic impedance does as well. Here I'm plotting uh, a normalized impedance index. It's called the index of impedance. Um, it's just a way of comparing, like I said before, sediments from different parts of the world with different core waters in them. Um, and I fit a generalist, generalized logistics curve to this. Um, it seems like it's sensitive to um, larger amounts of carbon. Let's look at some in situ sensor developments that I did back in uh, my postdoc at University of Texas. Um, so first of all, okay, we have P wave modulus. It looks like this in terms of density and sound speed. How do we measure that in situ? You can break it into sediment acoustic impedance and sound speed. Now, measuring sediment acoustic impedance is um, has is well understood. It's been done a long for a long time, so that can be done in situ pretty easily. And this acoustic notion of measuring acoustic impedance of the of the sediment in situ needs more um, more investigation. There's some papers out there that lay out a theoretical um, way of doing this, and I'll explain it in the next slide. Um, but it really hasn't been um, performed very frequently uh, in the field. So you can take a transducer and have an electric circuit theory analogy. And you can describe the transducer's behavior using this circuit. Um, not without going into every single element, uh, just note that this here is the total electrical impedance. If you were to take an um, equivalent circuit of this, you could find that this electrical impedance is a function of this acoustic impedance. So you can generally generalize these, or make these plots here. Electrical impedance is a function of frequency with um, sediments of varying impedance. So black is different sediments, blue is water, um, and uh, red is, is air. And at resonance, um, the, the impedance becomes real in the sense that these in, this inductor and this capacitor sort of cancel each other out and you just get a real component of, of a resistance here that, that depends on acoustic impedance. So if you take the minimum of these points, that is the, that is the uh, electrical impedance at resonance. You can either take that impedance uh, in terms of acoustic impedance and multiply it by your sound speed to get P wave modulus, or you can go straight to uh, impedance correlation here that I showed earlier. And then that can produce a, um, a curve that maps uh, electrical impedance at resonance of the sensor to the amount of organic carbon in, uh, in the sediment. So uh, here's some the sensor prototype. It's a bulky thing. And the reason why it was bulky was because I wanted to make sure I could take a core in between the sensors so that I could compare um, the in-situ measurements with ex-situ measurements back in the lab. Um, so in order to make all this rigid, it had to be relatively bulky, which was kind of a problem, but um, I'll, you know, I'll describe, I guess, the, the sensor. There's a source and a receiver. So you get the it's a pitch catch measurement similar to the core logger. Where you get sound speed. And then the electrical impedance of the source as it's vibrating can tell you about the acoustic impedance of the medium. And then, uh, strap the depth logger to this so it can measure how deep your sensors are. 
any given time. Um, and then you can take the core in between them. And this, this is all vertic vertically oriented, of course, when you're inserting it into the sediment. Here's the electric circuits that I uh, made. And it, there's an ultrasonic relay that switches between impedance and sound speed measurements. And the data was stored on a red pataya, which is kind of a neat um, RF uh, radio frequency, so high, really high frequency um, DAC that is pretty affordable. So we took this thing around, took it to different uh, sites. I won't go over this too much, but we measured a lot, we took a lot of measurements in the lower Domino Madre. Um, and here's our lab. We actually just rented a an Airbnb um, between all the scientists that were part of this study. This is, wasn't just me doing this. There, was, there were other things going on in the seagrass meadows. But, but the lab was, was a pretty nice Airbnb that had a dock and we, our collaborator down there had a boat. So we just kept the boat on the dock. It was, it was a really nice setup. Um, just so look at the preliminary measurements. Um, you know, the impedance measurement lacks stability. So the amount of the measurements that, that agreed with the model, with, with the ex situ measurements were few. And I, and I know why that is, and I'll get into that in the next slide, but we have um, depth profiles of acoustic impedance, sound speed, P wave modulus, density, organic carbon, and the lines are in situ measurements of these things. And the data points are ground truth that were taken in the lab either using geotechnical analysis or the core analysis logger, or uh, here we use the elemental analyzer, for instance, to get organic carbon. And there's reasonable agreement, particularly with sound speed, which is nice, um, but there, there needs to be some work done uh, to develop further this impedance method. So there are many more failures than successes. Um, I am a mechanical engineer by background. My degrees are in mechanical engineering, so I was happy to report that there were no failures, mechanically speaking. Um, but, and there were also really good agreement with um, sound speed between PARL and AROC. AROC, I'm, I'm, I didn't mention the acronym, but it's Acoustic Reader of Organic Carbon is what the name is. Um, so I refer to that, that's what it means. Uh, the failures were, it was A, and really difficult to insert into compact sediments because it was bulky nature of me needing to put a core in between the sensors. Uh, the impedance measurement lacked stability, uh, so it needs more controlled um, analysis in the laboratory to figure out what's wrong. I'm not an electrical engineer either, so if any of you guys are and want to uh, collaborate with me on this, I would, I would really enjoy that. Um, this kind of shows, this next bullet point kind of shows my, what, what my, my, uh, how naive I am. Um, so an RF amp has a really low input impedance. Um, and so when you're measuring things that have low impedances, um, or even if you're measuring things with high impedances, the, the, imp the circuitry of the DAC will affect the measurement because they have, they're comparable. They're much, this has, the RF uh, DAC has a lower input impedance than what I'm actually measuring. So that was a big mistake. And I'm going to fix in the future. So in conclusion, um, first thing we did was in this talk was established a relationship between the time scale of a variability, the sediment diffusion coefficient, and the frequency of the signal. Um, remember this plot here. Um, the one thing to note, one caveat is that you have to um, take the magnitude of the variability into account in order to say whether or not it matters per se for your application, um, but at least it's a, a step forward. Uh, we looked at some preliminary biologically active or preliminary results from biologically active sediments. Found that in general it increased attenuation due, potentially due to these uh, this viscous um, constituent in the sediment. It decreased the sound speed um, as more burrowing in fauna occupied a certain space. And there was an increased anisotropy with increasing biodensity. And finally, um, we looked at organic, the fact that organic carbon uh, pretty conclusively drives the changes in the sediment. Um, another caveat being this was 
only one seagrass meadow in South Texas? How does this change in terms of region, in terms of seagrass um, species? All unclear, so that needs more investigation as well. And just uh, look into this in situ ultrasonic probe. It, it shows promise. Again, it needs to be developed further. So this is my last slide, uh, some kind of what I'm doing now and what I plan to do in, in the near future. I'm part of this task force initiative uh, funding that the Navy um, supplied to a lot of academics. Uh, this is Tony's project that I've been working on and I'm, I'm really interested in the, how quickly, wow, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. How quickly the um, acoustic signal that's reflected from the ocean bottom, how quickly does that decorrelate? What are the time scales involved in that and, and what causes them? Um, so if you if you were at Matt's defense or yes thesis defense yesterday, Matt Couture, um, he talked a lot about this apparatus. Uh, it's just a acoustic backscattering, long term acoustic backscattering um, apparatus, and you can do things like find the decay con time constants uh, as a function of at, at different frequencies here as a function of days. And so you see some pretty wild fluctuations in terms of how quickly does the sediment decorrelate, and we're continuing to look into that. Um, I have a little bit of money to look at some finite element modeling, acoustic uh, finite element modeling, and really excited to look at scattering from rough surfaces. Um, the money was mostly made uh, assigned to, to look at worm burrows, so I've been talking to uh, Jen Dykstra. She's been informing me on where to go if I want to look for worm tubes or worm burrowing. Etc. cetera, um, to, to, to then be able to model this and find the elements, high fidelity, find the element modeling, and then be able to predict uh, how the acoustic scattering changes over time using like random walk models, for instance, of, of, of um, these burrowing events happening over, over long periods of time. And um, I'm, I'm, since we have this capability, this finite element modeling capability, uh, I'd really like to look at um, seagrass ecology or seagrass um, and salt marsh anatomy um, and see how those air channels actually influence uh, scattering um, from from them and so this is a I'm, I'm continuing to work with in with this um, with my collaborators back in, in texas um, advising a graduate student back there he's looking at the leaves but i'm in, i'm interested in the below ground biomass as you can imagine um, so I've been talking to, to David Burdick about um, where to go and, and what kind of projects um, he'd be interested in collaborating with me. Um, so next, uh, I proposed a, I submitted a proposal with my collaborators back in Austin to, a, to NASA and their carbon monitoring systems um, uh, proposal. And the idea is to further develop this blue carbon probe for seagrass, but also to um, compare those in situ measurements with satellite data to see if that can be any sort of type, any type of remote sensing of, of seagrass uh, carbon sequestration. And lastly, um, I, I'd like to continue that development of that qualitative, hopefully soon to be quantitative um, organic sediment model. Um, and so to do that, again, I need more laboratory experiments. So I'm talking to um, Kai Zervogel a little bit, and he has these really neat um, ways of producing marine snow uh, in, in the lab. And so the idea is maybe we could do that to, to formulate um, more natural organic sediments uh, in the lab and measure them acoustically. So just like to acknowledge the co-authors and sponsors and thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gabe. I, I forgot to mention um, in this question and answer part of, of Gabe's presentation, if you could either let me know in the chat that you have a question or just raise your hand, I can see all of your little icons there. Um, and I will call on you and uh, you can unmute and ask, ask Gabe your question. 
working. So I will start because I know what Gabe's been doing, but I have, I have some questions. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask you a question. I see some questions coming in, but my, my question is your sensors that you've developed and um, the modeling you've done um, sort of all um, point towards a point measurement. Either you're taking a core and making a measurement or you're putting an instrument in the, in the seagrass bed or whatever and taking a point measurement. I think the, ho the holy grail is always, can I do this over wide areas? So if I'm looking at Posidonia or eelgrass or, or whatever um, the carbon storage system is, um, uh, do you have anything to say about whether this can be expanded to remotely sensing these changes using active acoustics? Um, so I've been a part of um, experiments where with my collaborators that we pay, we put sources and receivers, stationary sources and receivers in seagrass meadows and are able to um, propagate that sound over larger areas. And really, it's sensitive to a lot of things, but mostly you get a lot of signal from the photosynthetic activity and the amount of total biomass that, that you have. Um, you can't really do that at high frequencies required um, to not have the, um, the inclusions, these air inclusions inside the, the leaves and the roots and everything. Um, you can't you can't propagate that far away using such high frequency uh, acoustics. Um, and if you're looking at above from like a, for example, using a downward looking sonar or something, you get a lot of backscatter um, from the leaves and you can't actually penetrate into the sediment. So that's why I'm, since I'm interested in the, the, the sediment and how 90% of this carbon is stored in the sediment, and that's why I went with point measurements that I can actually insert into the sediment. And so it might sound cumbersome to make point measurements everywhere, but if you can do it fast enough, you can you could pinch it, potentially that, that's what I'm proposing in this NASA grant, is you can put it on the edge of a power pole. A power pole is a thing on a boat that sticks into the ground. People use it for fishing, but you, we also, our boat, see it here actually, these are the two power poles that this boat has. Um, you can. Envision attaching that sensor to this power pole, and it can just lower, take a sample, uh, and then retract, and then move to the next station. And so you can potentially do this really quickly um, with point measurements. Okay, thank, thanks, Gabe. Uh, Larry Mayer has a question. So, Larry, you want to unmute? Yeah, this is this is the re the real Lawrence Mayer, not that that. Right. I noticed that there were two. The pretender, at the, yeah, we were office mates actually at Scripps. For, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I really, I, I also appreciate your work as well, but I, I was in, well, a lot of his stuff really guided um, the, the, this qualitative model I had of what's going on. With uh, and we, we, we could talk a lot about that because he and I worked early early on on, on combination of acoustics and, and organic stuff. At, oh, uh, really? but, yes. that, but, but that's a different subject. Um, Did we lose Larry's internet? Yeah, I'm not hearing him. Sorry. Larry, we lost your, your audio. Maybe move to Tom Weber, whose hands up, and come back to Larry when he reconnects. Okay, let's let's do that. Larry. Or maybe Larry, maybe Larry could answer or put his question in the chat if he lost his audio. You want to stick your question in chat, Larry? But Tom can ask his. Tom, I see your hand is raised. Tom, can you want to you and answer while Larry's working on this question? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, thanks for the talk, Gabe. That was that was really interesting. I, I had a a question that I thought you actually answered in some of your last statements, but then I'm confused. Is there something? You're, you're, and your answer to Tony's question and 
and thinking about that in, in this picture here, that's particular to seagrass meadows. Uh, I'm wondering about what about other organic carbon sequestered in, in the seabed that has, you know, it's just there maybe in, in deeper water. Um, is there anything specific to, to seagrass or is that just, I get that that's an important and and an interesting place to work, but does the same idea, the same curves that you have with regard to percent organic carbon and, and the, the P wave modulus, is that gonna apply just generally, do you think? Or is there something particular to seagrass meadows? I certainly think so. Um, and there has been a couple of other studies that have looked into, for example, um, there is a um, study down in Brazil where they looked at a mud bank off the, off the Amazon and they were able to use um, bottom looking um, profilers to invert for acoustic, um, sediment, um, organic carbon from just the impedance. So yes, they've done that in the, in the mud banks. This hasn't been done in seagrasses, but um, there's also good correlations in the North Sea. I've seen some papers in the North Sea where they, they did look at our total organic carbon and, and there's a similar correlation than what I'm seeing at the seagrass meadow located there where there's no seagrass, so yes. Could you, would it be um, too optimistic and, and too naive and wide-eyed to think that you could just use a, you know, a, a downward looking single beam echo sounder to, to go look at, at bottom loss and, and try to make some correlation there? Yeah, so I, I have never, I haven't tried. So, um, but I, we, we've been looking at some, we, we, have, we have some parametric uh, sonar that we looked at to try to quantify the seagrass coverage. Um, not looking at the organics in there, but um, yeah, I, sh I suppose I could look into that and see if I can get anything about the background sediment itself as opposed to the seagrass. So that so I'll just make one, make, make just one follow-up comment to that. And that is that um, I've sort of taken a little bit of, of kind of off piste time during the, during the break between semesters here. And I've been looking at data that's collected by um, NOAA in the Gulf of Maine, and they have a couple of different frequencies. They don't go lower than 18 kilohertz, but they, we have, there is data that extends over the entire Gulf of Maine going back some 10 or 20 years. And, and if there is some relationship there, that might be kind of an interesting thing to try to tease out of that kind of data yeah. um, to look at sort of climatological trends. I realize 10 to 20 years doesn't get it, but, but, you know, they're going to keep doing this and, and setting those baselines might be a really interesting thing to do if there's any meat on that bone. So just, just a thought that relates to, to things I've been looking at and thinking about lately. It's really interesting. So thanks. I think uh, Larry, uh, the real Lawrence mayor is, is back on. Oh, I can't <laughs> hear you. Dang it. Oh, you're out again. Uh, use sign language or something. You're unmuted, but no sound is coming through. Maybe fiddle with your... Uh, He's an acoustician, so can't be expected to read lips, I think, probably. Lacking local technical support. I think I might hear him really at a really low level, so maybe some signals coming through, just not quite in the right contact. Yeah, I hear that. I hear you blowing into it. I don't hear your voice. How's that? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. There you are. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I, I put on a microphone because of the last problem, but I realized it had an off switch on it. Okay. Well, it was great waiting because Tom asked my question, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which which really you know it goes back to Tony's question uh, uh, about in situ you know a broad area measurement, and I think again looking at bottom loss and and attenuation, which can also I think uh, I think from your plot show it had a had a, a nice relationship to organic content. May, maybe uh, maybe very helpful too. But let me let me switch to a, a, a separate question, um, and that's why I'm intrigued by your in situ impedance measurement, and um, 
you know, clearly it, it, it has issues and that's not surprising. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but your in situ sound speed appeared to be relatively robust. Um, and so if you have a robust in situ sound speed measurement, you uh, clearly have just the density left to, to resolve. And I just, I just wondered if you ever considered also trying to make an in situ density measurement. Um, uh, you know, there are gamma ray probes and things like that. And, and I say that just from a gut feeling that if you get a robust density, in situ density measurement and a robust uh, sound speed measurement, that their product will probably not be the same <laughs> as the uh, acoustically measured impedance. And I think that difference will probably uh, provide uh, some, this is totally speculative, so, some insight into uh, what's really going on in the sediment. Um, but uh, there, I, I don't think, uh, I don't know how expensive they are, but uh, in-situ gamma ray probes are, are often used to, to make uh, uh, density measurements, density logs. Yeah, and, and that's def certainly a way of, of getting impedance. I, I just went with this other. Um, oh no, I'm not suggesting this be this be the way you do it. Uh, yeah. I, I, I certainly would ri would rather see a, a direct measurement of impedance. Uh, uh, I'm just saying as you're trying to understand what's going on and and, and oh sure yeah what's I mean, causing the problem that you you know you take do a few experiments where you would measure both the components and and then uh, then look at again I suspect they're gonna end up being different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I've never had my hands on a, on a gamma ray um, density sensor. So yeah. I'm sure Dale, Dale has one, I'm sure, somewhere. Oh, neat. OK, yeah. Thank OK, you. thank you. OK, we're at uh, about 10 after. So if you guys have more questions for Gabe, you can get in touch with him. Um, thank you, Gabe. And if you want to give him some claps now? I think that would be appropriate. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you. I'll do it even with her. <laughs>